Thanks, Chris. Hey, so today we're going to talk about engine failures after maintenance. So first off, let's start with a quick uh, background. I'm Tim Haley. I'm the Fast Team Program Manager out of Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm a GA aircraft mechanic for 41 years. I've worked in a 140 145 repair station for 22 years. Commercial rated pilot, currently on a super decathlon. I fly it regularly. I started with the FA in 2006 and I was a maintenance inspector and I've been with the FAST team for the last four years. There's my email address. So if you wanna shoot me a question after this presentation, feel free to do that. This presentation is the first in a series about engine failures after maintenance. Engine failures after maintenance is another way of saying maintenance errors. This presentation is a list of accidents that illustrate the most popular mistakes that cause engines to quit. We know cylinder attachment and through bolt failure are significant causes of engine failure because the FAST team's analysis tool shows it. An image on this slide is a screenshot of the FAST team's data analysis tool. We call it FATBAT for short. It filters the NTSP data through the FAA system to allow us to look up things like accidents caused by engine failure due to maintenance error. If we set it to check for maintenance issues in aircraft power plants, incorrect service maintenance, it will filter that data to give us the mistakes caused by maintainers. Here it's provided a list of 181 accidents covering all types of injuries. So let's take a look at them 181 accidents and see what they are. Almost 12% of all aircraft accidents reported cite a maintenance factor. When failure or malfunction of aircraft equipment is part of an accident or incident, one third of these malfunctions relate to a maintenance error. Part of this research for this safety enhancement required us to discover the top 10 causes for engine system and component failures. The top 10 include cylinder torque, engine controls, B nuts, magnetos, carburetor, valve train, induction system, loose accessories, oil filter adapters, and connecting rods. It is surprising how often this happens. Let's take a look at the NT da NTSB database. All the accidents cited in this presentation, we have the NTSB number. And if you email me, I can send you the number. You can look the accident up on the NTSB database. The problem is that the bolts that clamp the case halves and attach cylinders require technicians to follow a sequence determined by the manufacturer. The reason this is so important is that having sufficient preload is the key to a reliable and robust joint that will not loosen, fail from fatigue, or shift under the load. For a bolt joint to be stable under vibration, the preload on the fastener must be greater than the maximum pressure pulling the joint apart. If the bolt tension is greater than the peak pressure pulling the joint apart, it will not separate or subject the bolt to repetitive stress cycles. If bolts are under tension, they are subject to bending forces that tend to work hard in them. It's like ripping a soda can in half by bending it back and forth until the aluminum work hardens and cracks. The pipe error in this picture had a dad and two daughters in it when the number one cylinder made a break for freedom. Happily, as you can see from the picture, dad got the airplane back on the ground. This outcome is not always typical. Second picture is of an ag airplane that encountered the same issue. Engine failure surprised the pilot and the landing was made, was the type that the pilot could walk away from, so that's good, but he was not able to fly the airplane again until after they repaired it. The pilot stated that while maneuvering at 1500 feet, he heard a deep knock in the engine. The entire windshield became covered with oil, the engine lost power, Post-accident examination of the engine revealed that the number two cylinder had separated from the cylinder mounting deck. What happened? <clears throat> what the NTSB determined, we're talking about cylinder hold down and case through bolt torque. 
Every engine manufacturer has a torque sequence to ensure technicians properly torque through bolts and cylinder hold down bolts. We want to encourage everybody to follow the manufacturer's instructions when performing this task. Let's talk about torque. Torque is the turning or twisting force and differs from tension created by a straight pull. Tension, the thread angles in the bolt convert the rotational force applied into tension or stretch on the bolt shank. The amount of tension created in the bolt is critical. Preload, the tension created by torquing a fastener that holds assembly parts. Having sufficient preload is the key to reliable and robust joints that will not loosen, fail from fatigue, or shift under the load. For a bolt, bolt joint to be stable under vibration, the preload on the fastener must be greater than the maximum pressure pulling the joint apart. If the bolt tension is greater than the peak pressure pulling the joint apart, it will not separate or subject the bolt to repetitive stress cycle. If the bolt's under tension, they are subject to bending force and that tends to work hard then. There is sufficient dif differences between fatigue failure and instantaneous failure. Fatigue failures are latent in that they take time to propagate. The latent nature of the fatigue crack is that it usually waits to strike until the most inconvenient time to show up. It means fatigue failures generally cause accidents as opposed to being caused by the accident. Investigators can determine by the fractured surface if a particular fastener caused the accident or the crack originated as a result of the accident. The crack inches across the fastener causing breach marks until finally the fastener has lost enough strength to instantaneously fail, leaving a 45 degree or she uh, shear lift. That is a fatigue failure. failure. Fatigue failure is the failure caused by under torquing. Instantaneous failure is indicated by stretching, bending, and various types of mangling of the bolt. The forces of an accident cause instantaneous failure. The pilot stated that while maneuvering at 1,500 feet, he heard a deep knock in the engine. The entire windshield became covered with oil and the engine lost power. The pilot made a forced land into a service road during which the airplane struck a barbed wire fence with the right wing before coming to rest in the field. Post-action examination of the engine revealed that number two cylinder had separated from the cylinder mount deck. Two fracture sections of the left crank case that indicated part of the number two cylinder bore were found in the engine cowling. All but one of the number two cylinder base studs and through bolts remained in the cylinder bore and were fractured. The fractured surfaces exhibited significant cons consistent signatures with fatigue. The fatigue failure of the number two cylinder stud and through bolt and the fractures of the crank case led to the loss of engine power. NTSB determined probable cause was fatigue failure of the number two cylinder stud through bolts and then fracture of the crankcase, which resulted in a total loss of engine power. This slide illustrates the failure cycle of the cylinder hold down bolts. It works a bit like a zipper. When one bolt fails, it pulls more stress on the others until they fail. This sequence does not mention what indicated the failure, the NTSB says fatigue failure of the number two cylinder stud through bolt and a fracture of the crankcase. However, it's probably happened quite quickly, instantaneously once the through bolt, through bolt failed. Here's a more visible version of the chart. These bolts failed in fatigue from being loose. These two fail instantaneous due to the rest of the bolts failing in fatigue. Crankcase probably failed after the cylinder liberated the rod and piston as it blew through that big hole in the cowling. Most service information has the required requirements to torque both sides of the engine. 
It seems somewhat redundant, but necessary if you want the cylinder to remain installed. There is a bit of friction between the case and the through bolt, enough to change the torque value. Notice on the left diagram, there are instructions to torque both sides at once, and on the right diagram, instructions to tighten the left and right side. The torquing sequence is complex so that it's vital to follow the instructions, even if this means taking off the opposite cowling, cooling bafflings, and et cetera. It's so much better to eat some flat rate than to cause a crash. Here's a quote from the Lycoming -like service instruction. This is the section on replacing one cylinder. They are very forthright about the torque in both sides of the engine. Why is this important? Three bolts tend to loosen on the side of the engine opposite of the cylinder that's being installed. The through bolt land has a very tight fit in the crankcase so that the through bolt can act as the locating dial for the engine main bearing. When a technician removes a cylinder, the through bolt tends to slip towards the opposite cylinder. This movement reduces the preload on the through bolt. Since we use a torque wrench to measure preload, the friction between the through bolt and the case is sufficient to affect the torque reading and the preload. This slippage may well cause the preload to be under requirements and the through bolt will fail in fatigue. Here's a clue. This image on the slide is the engine of a Mooney with an oil leak from the engine splines. Not too evident from the uh, picture, but the entire engine case is covered in oil. Here's the vice that the owner got from the internet. That's a lot of oil. Feel free to run a beta pro seal along the top of the case. But with that amount of oil, I think it much more than just the case have seeping. I would suspect the case has a crack. Also, the front seal is a known leaking point. Also, there was another uh, blog about it. That's a lot of oil. I had two of them leak after an engine was overhauled and they were retightened to the specified torque in the service bulletin and we had no problem since. That looks like it may be something other than a bolt leaking. The question at this point would be, has the number two cylinder been changed? The one with the rusty flat, the nut with the rusty flat on it, is that where the torque seal used to be? Let's go with the second reply. All seeping from the case has can indicate that the through bolts are not properly torqued. Loosened through bolts causes the case to rub and fret. As the frets further release the through bolt torque, as that case wears together, we're going to get even more reduced torque there. Reducing the preload then causes the through bolt to fail in fatigue. The cylinder hold down bolts then unzip, allowing the cylinder to try, and try to find its way out of the cowling. Epoxy seal on the backbone. This is not a good sign. Oil should not be leaking from the spline of the engine. Oil leaking from the engine spline, gobs of pro seal and epoxy on the engine spline, keeping the oil in is an indication that the engine needs a good torque check. The idea is to find out why is it leaking. Here's our odd parking spot. Everyone walked away from this, which is good. They just had to walk for a while. This example is a blown cylinder, but since we are on the topic of sealant, a maintainer applied RTV to the engine through bolts. It helped keep the bolt in the engine but it acts like installing a spring under the through bolt. It guarantees the bolts will be under torque and fail. In this case, the through bolt failed, which causes the main bearing to spin and soon after the crankshaft to fail. We see the same situation with the cylinder base O-rings. The mechanics inherently want to try to do it better and they'll add RTV sealant to the O-ring going on the base of the cylinder. This keeps the cylinder from having the, pro the proper preload on the through bolts because eventually that RTV sealant is going to get out of there and it's going to leave. And once it leaves, now we have a gap. Now that through bolt doesn't have the proper torque.
engine controls. When engine controls become disconnected or jammed, it is very much like an engine failure. There are two examples on this slide. One was a Mooney on an instructional flight when the throttle cable became disconnected. And the other is a Piaggio with a clevis pin installed backwards. The Mooney, an N201, throttle cable disengaged when the castellated nut backed off after operating without a cotter pin installed to secure the nut. A CFI and a student were practicing instrument maneuvers about 1,500 feet when the engine stopped, responding to the throttle control inputs and producing enough power to maintain level flight. They chose to conduct an off-airport landing in the field, which substantially damaged the fuselage in the wings. Yagio, during the climb to cruise, the engine power levers became jammed in the full forward position. This condition resulted in an engine over torque and an engine over temp condition, and the captain shut down the left engine. The captain diverted to a nearby airport and attempted a single engine precautionary landing. After touchdown, the captain applied reverse thrust on the right engine and the airplane veered to the right, departing from the surface impact and terrain, flipped over and came to rest inverted. The NTSB said the probable cause, the captain's failure to maintain directional control during landing with one engine in opted. Contributing to the accident was an improperly installed clevis pin in the left engine power lever. The crew delayed in accurately identifying their heading and then substantially selection of a runway with a strong crosswind. So on that airplane, the hardware was installed backwards and it jammed up on the controls. B-nuts, let's talk about B-nuts. B-nuts cause all sorts of trouble. They fasten tubing that contain fluid under pressure, sometimes flammable fluids, sometimes air, sometimes sensing pressure. These are excellent reasons to make sure B-nuts fit and are tight. The idea is to finish the job or unfasten the connection. Never leave a B-nut hand tight. It takes a while for the B-nut to vibrate loose and that may well provide it time for a pilot to get into a tight spot. You know, a lot of shops have the rule that a bee nut is either all the way on or all the way off, or any part by that matter. It's either all the way on or all the way off. You don't leave it in the middle. So the example here on the left is the bee nut was run on hand tight. And from some other accidents that were reviewed, it takes four or five hours for a hand tight bee nut to finally make its way back off and for the failure to come. So the question is, the bee nut was run on hand tight. Why did the technician not go ahead and torque the bee nut? Could be several reasons. Maybe it was distraction. Maybe he was, maybe they were in the middle of texting back and forth with a spouse, or maybe they were texting a friend. Cell phone distractions in the workplace lead to a lot of these accidents. So let's take a look at the one on the left, that's a Bell 206. The helicopter had landed on an offshore oil platform and was refueled. Then it took off with one passenger. Shortly after liftoff, the pilot heard a loud pop as the nose of the aircraft passed over the edge of the helideck. As the helicopter yawed and lost climb performance, the pilot lowered the collective down, activated the floats, and upon landing on the water, the aircraft rolled to the left till it was inverted. NTSB determined that the possible loss of engine power due to the maintenance personnel failure to connect, failure to properly torque the B-nut allowed the PC line to remove and reinstallation of turbine. The PC line was disconnected during the removal and installation of the turbine module. Improper torque on the B-nuts what caused it to back off. And once that B-nut backed off, they lost the PY sense and and the engine shut down. So we're talking about distractions in the workplace. Yeah, cell phone distractions. Maybe he quit for the day and went home. 
maybe they uh, it was lunchtime and they left and went to lunch. Either way, you know, a simple rule of it's either all the way on or all the way off wasn't followed. Cirrus, <clears throat> Cirrus SR-22, the pilot reported that while climbing the airplane to cruise altitude, the engine temperature increased quickly and the engine then surged. The pilot added that he switched the boost pump, adjusted the mixture lever, and then deployed the ballistic chute at 3,500 feet. NTSB said the probable cause was the mechanics failure to properly secure the air reference line, which resulted in loss of engine power. Magnetos, ignition system. Let's talk about that for a minute. Magnetos are supposed to be a redundant system, but a failure of one magneto can cause an engine to run very poorly. The Piper accident occurred because the right mag fell off. The person who installed it didn't torque the attachment nuts. This is not precisely a magneto issue, but it is surprising how often loose mags cause problems. The engine probably did not run well before the mag fell off. Cessna accident occurred because the maintainer used a drill bit as a timing pin and then turned the engine with the bit, breaking it off. The NTSB doesn't mention why the drill bit caused the engine to quit, but it may have been a cause for a crossfire that caused the engine to run poorly. Back to the Piper. The pilot and the passenger smelled something burning. Smoke began to fill the cockpit and the oil pressure dropped. The prop then oversped and then the engine seized. In the ensuring forced landing, it was in the dark, the airplane struck trees and impacted a ditch. The engine was covered with oil. The right mag was found hanging by the spark plug wires. This is where the mechanics failure to actually torque the right magneto attachment nuts allowed the right magneto to become loose, which allowed the engine to lose oil. In the Cessna 206, the pilot reported that during takeoff, as the airplane was between 20 to 30 feet above the ground, he felt the engine surge and then lost power. The airplane was traveling too fast to stop on the remaining runway, and it impacted the ditch at the end of the runway. Having your engine quit at 20 to 30 feet over the end of the runway is a pretty helpless feeling. NTSB said, Loss of engine power due to malfunction magneto contributed to the accident with the maintenance personnel improper use of a drill bit instead of a timing pin during magneto installation. Here's how two examples of ignition issues other than caused by a magneto, but still just as dangerous as both aircraft Spark plugs blew out of their engine, causing them to quit. Cessna 152. On an instructional flight, the student pilot applied throttle. The engine immediately began to run rough. The certificate flight instructor decided to form a forced landing in a farm field. During the landing roll, the nose gear came in contact with soft soil and the airplane nosed over. A post-accident examination of the engine revealed that the bottom spark plug and associated helical on the number four cylinder had separated from the cylinder. On the Cessna 152, a student pilot had conducted two takeoffs and landed without incident. During the initial climb after the third takeoff, he heard a loud pop. The airplane started to vibrate, severe, swerved, lost engine power. He executed a forced landing on the nearby field. Examination of the airplane revealed the lower spark plug number two cylinder and its associated thread insert was missing. NTSB determined that the mechanics improper installation of a helical, which resulted in the separation of a spark plug and the helical, had led to the partial loss of engine power. In the investigation, the NTSB determined one of the helicals was not the proper size. If you refer to the service instructions, when replacing the helical in that cylinder, you're supposed to install an oversized helical. 
So the question now comes, why would we have the improper size helical installed in that cylinder? Could be several reasons. Maybe the technician went to the parts counter, didn't have the right size helical, decided that standard helical would just have to work because he needed to get the job done. He was under the pressure of getting the job done and decided to use the wrong part instead of using the correct part because he needed to get the job finished. Maybe the technician didn't know it needed. Maybe he hadn't even read the service instructions to know that it needed an oversized helicoil. He just went to the parts counter, said, give me a helicoil. They gave him one. He installed it. He didn't look up what the proper part number was. Several different things could have led to the fact of the technician installing the wrong part. In the end, the issue was still the same. We had a spark plug blow out of the cylinder. Carburetors. Let's talk about carburetors for a minute. Carburetors are complex little machines. They are also single points of failure. While they seem very simple, there are critical dimensions that require special tools and documentation to achieve. A Cessna 182A, shortly after leveling off and beginning the cruise portion of the cross-country flight, the engine lost all power. The private pilot performed a forced landing on a highway. However, just before landing flare, the airplane's vertical stabilizer struck the power cable and partially separated the tail column. So here's some background. Shortly after leveling off and beginning the cruise portion of the cross-country flight, engine lost all power. The private pilot performed a forced landing on the highway. However, just before landing flare, the airplane's vertical stabilizer struck a power cable and partially separated from the telecom. Post-accident examination of the engine revealed that the carburetor drain plug was missing. The pilot stated that he had flown the airplane using automotive gas for about two months before the accident. When the engine was Sustainably difficult to start, the pilot removed the carburetor drain plug to purge the system of all motor fuel. He stated that he did not use safety wire to secure the plug after performing this operation. Maintenance personnel examined the carburetor after the pilot reported that the engine was running rough about two months before the accident. And again, during the airplane's annual inspection, about a month before the accident, Although maintenance personnel reported that on both occasions the drain plug was secured with safety wire, physical evidence suggests that the drain plug had never been secured with safety wire. Because of this contradictory statement and inclusive evidence, it was, was not possible to determine who was responsible for not safety wiring the drain plug. So the owner is using automotive gas Besides that maybe he's got some bad gas, he takes the drain plug out, drains the carburetor, he puts the drain plug back in, but he admitted that he didn't safety wire. It is legal for owners to work on the airplane, but when an owner is working on the airplane, he has to follow the same rules and regulations that the mechanics do. Just because he's a pilot and doesn't have an AMP doesn't give him a break from following the same rules that they do. He has to follow 4313, he has to follow part 43, he has to make a logbook entry, and he has to perform the task in accordance with approved maintenance manuals. So just keep that in mind if you're an owner trying to do maintenance. And as a mechanic, keep in mind that maybe the owner has been doing maintenance on the airplane. So be looking for these types of things like a drain plug not being safety. Valve train. PA-28R, here's an example of what happens when a maintainer assembles the tappets wrong. Notice the little piston. The spring end shows how the accident aircraft had the piston installed backwards. In this case, the technician installed all eight of the tappets backwards. This misassembly of the tappet caused the number three cylinder intake valve to fail and the engine to quit. A post-accident examination of the engine revealed that the number three cylinder intake valve had separated. The valve stem was found in the oil pan and the remainder of the valve was found in the intake manifold. 
Molecular examination of the number three cylinder, including the fractured intake valve, revealed that the valve was fractured in the stem in two places and through the head in one place. The interior of the cylinder exhibited damage constant with the impact of the fractured valve. The connecting rod was intact, but the bearings were worn through both the tappet and the copper layer. Examination of the fracture service revealed that the T cracks initiated from the fillet radius between the bow stem tip and the key area of the stem shaft. The outer fracture were constant with overstress. Further examination of the engine case revealed that all eight hydraulic tablet plungers were installed 180 degrees opposite of the proper installation contained in the manufacturer's overhaul manual. The reverse installation of the plunger would have adversely affected operation of the number three cylinder intake valve and placed an abnormal load on the valve tips. A review of the engine logbooks revealed that the engine had been repaired about 35 hours prior to the accident. At this time, all four cylinders were removed and replaced, including the hydraulic valve tablet plunger assembly. Given that the cylinders had been recently removed and reinstalled on the engine, including the hydraulic valve tablet plunger, it's likely that the engine experienced a partial loss of engine power due to the maintenance personnel's improper installation of the valve tablet plungers. Induction system. Here are two examples of engine failure due to induction systems. The piper had the wrong hose installed. The proper hose is a double walled hose designed to withstand a negative pressure. The hose installed was a single wall hose that was in poor repair and it collapsed and caused the engine to fail. So that you can see that hose in the left picture. The engine just, it completely co collapsed and blocked the whole intake. Plus you can see the wire coming out. Probably that's getting ingested into that carburetor as well. The pilot reported that after advancing the airplane's throttle to full power for takeoff, the engine produced normal thrust. The acceleration was smooth and all indications were normal when the aircraft reached rotation. About 600 feet above the ground, the engine stopped, producing sufficient power, and the pilot returned to the runway just before landing. The aircraft impacted terrain in a tree. The induction air inlet duct was a single thickness scat hose, which was not the material described in the parts manual. Further, the carburetor into duct appeared to have been compressed due to negative air pressure during the high engine run, which had restricted the airflow in the engine and reduced the engine power. So the question is, who put the wrong scat hose on there? And how long has it been operating with the incorrect scat hose on there? All right, so in the pictures on the right, we're talking about a Champ 7 ECA. The pilot reported that the airplane landed, the airplane had climbed to about 900 feet above ground level after takeoff when the engine experienced a total loss of engine power. Post accident examination, the engine carburetor revealed that a large piece of foam from the air filter element was lodged in the venturi of the carburetor. It's likely that the air filter was installed incorrectly thus causing the air filter element to become dislodged and drawn into the carburetor venturi. That type of foam air filter usually has a 12 month service life. A lot of people will say, well, my airplane's only flown five hours since the last annual, how can that foam air filter be bad? Well, maybe it's not bad, but that doesn't relieve you of the responsibility that the manufacturer says that filter has to be replaced every 12 months. Doesn't say you have to be replaced every X number of hours, it says 12 months. So every annual, that new foam filter should be getting changed out. By this filter, first off, it's installed backwards, but the way it come apart, it looks like to me that that filter had probably been in there for a while. Loose accessories. We've already covered a magneto falling off. Here's a more subtle case of a loose accessory. It's a loose vacuum pump. It does not look very loose, but it's loose enough to pump the engine oil overboard. The blank of the pilot was conducting a local flight, had been airborne for about 40 minutes when he heard a bang. The engine began to shake, experienced a total loss of power. 
The pilot conducted a forced landing and the air, airplane impacted a stand of pine trees before coming to rest. Disassembly of the engine found only a small amount of oil in the engine sump, as well as numerous metal pieces. The crankshaft number five journal rod exhibited heat damage and the connecting rod had separated from the journal. Consistent with the lack of oil, a review of the engine maintenance record revealed that the engine had accumulated about 263 hours since overhaul. Record shows that a vacuum pump had been replaced just 1.2 hours at the time of the accident. The accident is consistent with loss of engine oil from the vacuum pump drive. It's likely a result of the maintenance personnel improper securing of the vacuum pump following replacement. Some of these vacuum pumps, that drive seal on the engine will start leaking oil and that oil will get sucked into the, into the vacuum pump and cause that vacuum pump to fail. Technician will go in there and say, well, the vacuum pump's failed, changes out the vacuum pump, but doesn't investigate why the vacuum pump failed. Doesn't notice that the drive is leaking oil. Stalls a new vacuum pump. If that pump failed because it ingested oil from the leaking shaft, then the second pump's gonna ingest that same oil and you're gonna have a second vacuum pump fail. Now, before they could have a second vacuum pump fail, they pumped all the oil right out of the engine and they had that engine seize up. So when you have a part failure, you know, take a few minutes to look into and figure out what caused that part to failure. Maybe it is just age on that pump. Maybe that pump had 600 hours on it and it was at the end of its service life. Or maybe it ingested oil from a leaking shaft seal and that's how it got it. So. Take time to investigate and make sure that we're making an accurate determination on why a part failed. Engine oil adapters. If they're installed improperly, it can cause engines to pump oil overboard. It's common enough that we have two examples. The first is this Bonanza with a crushed fiber gasket. It caused the engine to lose oil and then power over the ocean. The Beach P-35 during cruise flight over open water, the airplane experienced a total loss of engine power and the pilot ditched the aircraft. Examination of the engine revealed that the oil filter adapter was loose and the fiber gasket was torn and, and partially extruded. The mistake here was to install the adapter with two copper crushed gaskets rather than one copper crush gasket and one fiber gasket per the manufacturer's installation instructions. Why would someone do that? Perhaps they didn't know the proper gasket was fiber. This possibility gives us the opportunity to say that any alteration has instructions for continued airworthiness, ICAs. To inspect and maintain a part like this oil filter adapter requires the maintainer to understand the ICAs and to review the ICAs. Anytime you bring that airplane in for an annual, you should be looking at ICAs to see how you inspect and maintain those alterations that's on that aircraft. It could be that the person who installed the copper gasket thought it would be equal to or better than. We're back to that same thing. A mechanic's wanting to make it better than it was originally. This is rather, some technicians use this idea to excuse less than complicated behavior. The problem is that something better than the original does not mean it meets the type design, or in this case, the properly altered condition. It's not airworthy. This is an excellent example of unintentioned consequences from the decision to make it better. Could be that when the airplane come in, it had two copper gaskets and and luckily it didn't start leaking oil. The mechanic took it apart and he had two copper gaskets, so he put it back that way. Either way, he didn't refer to the ICAs to see what the pop, proper installation was. This has been such an issue that the FAA has issued a safety alert for operators, a SAFO. If you're not familiar with SAFO 21001, look it up. This SAFO alerts restaurant owners, operators, and certificate repair stations of possibility of an FM Enterprise and Stratus Tool Technologies oil filter adapter in flight due to improper maintenance or installation process. The failure could result in a loss of engine power in flight to oil starvation.
NTSB also released information on it. This picture is straight from the NTSB safety alert. On May 1st, 2019, a Cessna 182 airplane experienced a total loss of engine power. During the emergency landing, the airplane collided with power lines near Mill Creek, California. One passenger was fatally injured. The pilot and the other passenger were seriously injured. NTSB found that the F and M oil filter adapter was loose. A fiber gasket between the engine oil pump assembly and the oil filter adapter was torn and had a crescent mark. The oil had leaked from the broken gasket. The oil leak led to the loss of engine power. There's at least 10 other airplanes with this type of oil filter adapter that have, have loss of engine oil and loss of engine power due to that oil leak. Here's a picture of the gasket they're talking about. You can see the tear and the crescent mark in there. Read the NTSB safety recommendation. Their report number is ASR-20-05. And there's also a Stratus Mandatory Service Bulletin SB-001. By ensuring that the adapter is installed properly, oil loss and potential engine power loss can be prevented. So, you haven't taken a chance to look at those two, look them up, especially if you're dealing with this oil filter adapter during the annual inspection. Connecting rods. This situation seems to be straight up mistake. It's one reason we asked someone to inspect our work. One of the rad, uh, rod, rod cap bolts did not have a cotter pin installed in the castellated nut. There's a good opportunity for getting a second set of eyes to look at it and verify what the problem is. The pilot reported that the engine oil temp was rising during cruise flight. He elected to reduce power and fly to the nearest airport. While en route, the engine experienced a catastrophic failure. About 20 engine operating hours before the accident, all the engine piston connecting rods and their respective bolts and nuts were replaced. It's likely at this time, one of the nuts was not properly secured with a cotter pin on the number two cylinder, connecting rods, allowing the nut to slowly back off and come apart. NTSB said maintenance personnel's improper installation of the number two cylinder connecting rod, which resulted in disconnection of the rod and failure of the engine. Here is the list of the top 10 causes of engine failure after maintenance. To be plain, we're talking about maintenance errors. It is an unremarkable mistake that generally comes back as a bothersome warranty claim that can trigger a catastrophic event that may well claim a life. Who would think that a couple of these loose nuts, distorted gasket, or I'm fixing it better than, would cause catastrophic failure of an engine in a fatal accident? We tend to think that horrendous mistakes lead to catastrophic outcome, but the reality of the industry is that the slightest mistake can lead to an unfortunate accident. In a lot of the accidents we investigate, it's a chain of events. It was no one thing that led to the accident. It was a sequence of events, and the disruption of any one of those items could have stopped that accident. So how do we stop this? Well, one, let's follow the manufacturer's process. Let's follow the instructions when the manufacturer's talking about how to properly clean the part or lube it, or if we need thread locker on there. Make sure we have the proper hardware. Make sure we have the right tools to be doing the job. Follow the torque sequence. Use calibrated tools. The maintenance personnel should reference the manufacturer's parts and service manual and the ICAs for correct processes, hardware, and torques for proper assembly. Service instructions are available online for free. Most of the engine manufacturers keep their uh, torque values in the service instructions. They do this because it makes it a whole lot easier for them to update a service bulletin than then it is to change the maintenance manual. That's another issue. Maybe a technician who's doing torque and doesn't have the latest service information bulletin and has the proper torque. Like I said, most of these service instructions are free online. Go on the internet, do a search, 
find it. Make sure you're using the right one. Training the peace of mind. Technical training, safety related training, get it documented in my AMT. There's a lot of courses on fasafety.gov that are free. Go on fasafety.gov, check out the courses, get some training. I wanna thank you for your time today. You're a vital member of our GA safety community. There's my name, my phone number, my email address. Don't hesitate to give me a call or shoot me an email. If you've got any kind of questions about anything, I'm here to help. Thank you.